All right. Good morning. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And as you can see, today we're going to talk about how vectors are the new JSON, which is a slightly provocative title, but let's understand why. The way I want to begin is with this. What is this? JSON, right? And what is JSON? JSON is a data structure. You know, it's a data structure, a substructure with data types. And what happened with JSON, you know, if we can go back you know, 15 years or so, maybe even more now, 20 years, is very popular in the web. You know, it became the lingua franca, just a common way of expressing things. But what's the typical pattern? Is that you had a web application, you need to send data to your server and store it and query it in the database, and you ended up building something like this, where you did exactly that. You, you would take your JSON structure, convert it to, say, a relational structure, and then store in the database for later use, and go back and forth between your client and your database and your server. And some people had the bright idea, like, gee, like, it feels like there's an intermediate step here. Why do I have to do all this conversion? Why can't I just store the JSON directly in the database and query it directly? Right? It's one extra step. And you know, one thing that we learn about when studying engineering is when you get to eliminate steps, technically things should get more efficient. But you know, there's a lot to consider there, right? Because the database does a lot more than just querying the data. There's a whole set of features that a database gives you. Now, as Simon Riggs mentioned in the keynote, one of the things he worked on was point-in-time recovery. That's a key aspect in making sure that your data remains safe or in the event of disaster, you're able to roll back to the point before the disaster occurred and have everything work as needed. Similar things happened here with JSON, too. Because again, first, JSON came about as a structure and a data type. And you know, kind of here's, you know, in this timeline, which is sort of like a Postgres-oriented history of JSON, you can see that as JSON became more popular with developers, there became a need to you know, store it, in many ways, directly within a database, which led to the emergence of databases that did exactly that. All they were used for was querying and storing JSON. Even though JSON prim primarily was the communication mechanism and a data type as part of that communication mechanism, it seemed like maybe it was easier. But you know, one thing I remember, even back in uh, this conference, uh, the last time we were here in Prague, there was a huge demand to be able to do this just in Postgres. Hey, I already have all my data in Postgres. I like using Postgres. It does all these other things that a database needs to do. Why can't I just store my JSON in Postgres? And lo and behold, Postgres became the first relational database to store JSON. And this, you, know, you can read through the whole history here. Like, a lot has certainly evolved in this world since po Postgres you know, broke the mold for a relational database to store JSON. But it was that common problem that there was a kind of application being built. And Postgres was able to adapt itself to be able to handle that kind of data from the application developer's needs. So let's go to today. There's a new data type a new data type that's becoming very popular. What is this? It's, it's a vector. Or it's a line, it's an arrow, you can call it whatever you want. And a vector is actually a relatively simple data type. It has a dimensionality. This is a two-dimensional vector. And it has some key properties to, to consider as well. It has a magnitude, which is the general size of a vector. And it has a direction, which is where it's pointed at in space. And you keep adding dimensions to it. You can see that this is a three-dimensional vector. At least I tried to draw it as a three-dimensional vector. Who knows how it came out? Quick story, I actually had a professor in college who drew like a four-dimensional shape on the board. I kid you not. And like, it was a four-dimensional shape. Like, blows my mind to this day. But when I say it's a new data type, it's not a new data type. It's a very old data type. I mean, really predates the notion of data types. You know, this, this book was actually originally published in 1901. Because the vector was this mathematical structure that is very important in physics and math. And again, going back to college, I took a class that basically was one year studying vectors and properties of vectors in n-dimensional spaces. So why are vectors popular all of a sudden? And I think most folks, if not all folks, likely know the answer to that in this room, which is there's a big buzz around AI, ML, generative AI. And the way I look at it, again, another hark back to college. I actually studied machine learning in college because I thought I was going to go into machine learning, not necessarily databases. I loved using databases, but I thought it was cool what you could do with ML. But back then, everything you did in machine learning was ad hoc, meaning that you had to build it yourself. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so much time. You know, it can't be commoditized. You know, it's a lot of effort. You know, I'm kind of an app developer. I just want to like, build things and get going. 
And besides, like vectors are a lot smaller back then. Uh, a 20 dimensional vector was considered a very large vector. And like even today, I don't know what a 20 dimensional vector is. Meanwhile, we're seeing you know, 1,500 dimensional vectors, 60,000 dimensional vectors, and on and on and on. But the big difference is that, in some ways, that doesn't matter to us. Because a lot of this has been abstracted away by these new AI models where you can send, semi-ironically, a JSON request and get back this, you know, this enriched answer from a machine learning model. And that's the big difference today, is that the, these models are just very accessible to app developers, where suddenly you're building these very rich predictive applications without having to do all that much work with them. And there's a common technique um, called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. You may have heard of it. And the idea is that when you're working with these big foundational models, which I should step back a second. So these foundational models are, are trained on vast amounts of data, typically publicly available. And granted, you can build your own foundational models on your own data. But a lot of the ones that you're using today are just generated on the entire internet, for lack of a better example. But there's a lot of data that lives in our databases, our Postgres databases, that you probably don't have available on the internet because you're keeping your databases behind several layers of firewalls so only your applications can directly access them. But you might have very common questions. Like, let's say I have a store selling you know, Slonic-type goodies, or in this case, I think I was selling uh, uh, Florida tchotchkes. And I might ask, how much does something cost? And if I just ask a foundational model directly, it's going to be like, I don't know, because like, I don't have access to your database. And that's where retrieval augmented generation comes in, because you do have that data in your database. And you can take that data and use it to augment or add to the foundational model at the time that your, your a user is asking a question and say, like, oh, yeah, I know exactly how much this thing costs. So here's the answer. And that's the personalization you're seeing in a lot of these new uh, generative AI applications being built. So this is pretty cool, because basically someone else might be doing all that work to train that foundational model. And then you can come in at the end of the day as the developer and just say, like, oh, yeah, I have this data stored in my database. I'm going to give this you know, enriched answer, and you're good to go. So what does this have to do with vectors? Well, we need some way to be able to map the information that's available in our, you know, in our own databases and bring into the foundational models and back, kind of like the way we use JSON to map information from a web client and get information back from our database. And this is, this is where the vector comes in. So this is your typical retrieval augmented generation workflow. And I'm just going to say RAG for short, if that's OK. The vector comes in in two places. The first part is in you know, the very beginning, that you might have some raw data. It could be you know, PDFs, document chunks, or it could just be data within your own database. And you go to something that's called an embedding model. So embedding model is similarly trained to these foundational models, where it you know, has looked over all sorts of data, and it's able to detect patterns in your raw text, and can convert it to a mathematical representation, which is the vector. And there's all sorts of embedding models out there that can generate vectors of all different sizes. You know, as database folks, you know, naturally, we want vector sizes to be as small as possible, because that means we're storing less data. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing you know, very large vectors. 1,536 dimensions tends to be a, a very popular one right now. But anyway, you take that data, you generate the vector, you store it in the database for later use. So that's part one of the process. This is sort of seeding your database for retrieval augmented generation. Then there's part two. Part two is a user comes in and asks a question. You know, how much does it cost to buy merch at the, the PGConf EU or the Postgres Europe table? So that question then has to go to embedding model, which is going to get a vector, which is going to be similar to, basically the vector is going to be used to query the database to find anything that's similar to that question. So looking for everything that's like, a, let's say, like a Slana hoodie at the table. So you, so you do that, so you make that query in the database, and then it gets passed back to the foundational model to help create that rich text answer that you see in the generative AI applications, and then it gets returned back to the user. So that's the role of the vector here. It's, just, it's effectively a gateway between all the different parts of these generative AI systems. Now, there's other ways of getting to that. You, you, know, you could do a full text search, you could do other kinds of searches, but What's nice, you know, similar to JSON, what's nice is that the vector is able to act as this gateway between all the systems. And effectively, it can work no matter what kind of system you're using, you know, regardless of database or programming language or whatnot, which is quite nice. Now, 
there's challenges with vectors. And it's interesting, right, because it is such a foundational data type. It's a foundational mathematical structure and something we've been working with for years. If you take an introductory computer science class, an array is one of the first data structures you learn. And a vector is just a superset of an array with different properties. But in these systems, there's a lot, there's a lot of challenges. The first, how long does it, you know, the time to generate these vectors? When you're going into these embedding models, it takes time. You know, it might take, it could take a few seconds, it could take a few hundred milliseconds, but you know, that does take time. If you have a couple of these, sure, that's not so bad, but if you have thousands and millions, it's gonna be very exhaustive. And then the size. Again, you know, a lot of these are 1500 dimensions, which are roughly six kilobytes. And there's quite a few problems in there. One is just like the sheer volume of data. If you have a million of these, that's already almost six gigabytes of data, which might not sound like much, but keep in mind, like you can store, you know, if you're not storing vector data in your Postgres database, you're storing just a million of rows of integers, text, et cetera, it's not gonna be six gigabytes, it's gonna be a, a fraction of that. Additionally, if you look at Postgres internals, the Postgres page, which is the foundational unit of storage, is eight kilobytes by default. So already we're starting to push the limits on that. And from a table storage standpoint, that's okay, we have ways of dealing with that. But it gets more challenging from an indexing standpoint where you actually do have that eight kilobyte limit. But then you're like, okay, Jonathan, well, there's ways to compress it, right? Not really, because these are just random four byte floating point numbers. There's really not that many patterns between them. So it's very challenging to compress. And there are techniques to reduce the size of the vectors, but there's a trade off because you typically lose information. And when you lose information, that's gonna impact the quality of your search, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And then finally, there's query time. And I have some bad news is that there's no shortcuts when comparing two vectors. So when you're, when you're querying against two vectors, you're trying to find the similarity between them, which you know, is roughly equivalent to the distance between two vectors. And you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that at length. But when you're calculating the distance between two vectors, you have to query every single dimension. You can't just like query half of them and say, I'm done, you know, these seem to be you know, close enough or far enough, because the latter half of the dimensions may skew that information. So a lot of the techniques we use to take shortcuts in the, in the data retrieval world don't work here. So that presents a challenge. And fortunately, there's been research that's been done over the past 20 years to try to, to be able to deal with this to speed things up, because naturally, we do want to make these queries as fast as possible. And this gets into this area of approximate nearest neighbor search. So exact nearest neighbor search, which is what we're generally used to, is something like, hey, you know, I'm standing right here. Who are the four closest people to me, which are the four folks right there in the front row? Approximate near, well, to, do an, to, to actually do an exact nearest neighbor search over a data set, you actually have to calculate it against everything in that entire data set. So even though I can clearly see there's four people right in front of me, if I were to do this as a database, I'd have to look at the distance between everyone in this room in order to be able to calculate that. Now, if I have a million 1500 dimensional vectors that are six gigabytes, that's gonna take some time. And to do it really quickly in Postgres, I need to bring all that data into memory, which means you need to have you know, roughly six gigabytes of shared buffers available. So there's a technique that's been invented called approximate nearest neighbor, which is the way to be able to find these results without having to search over everything. And that's nice because as we know from databases, when you're dealing with indexes and we're looking over a smaller set of data, we're able to do these lookups very quickly. Like a unique index with a B tree, I can find data just like that. So there is a way to be able to reduce the total time it takes to search for this information. And this will ultimately be faster than an exact nearest neighbor search, particularly as your data set grows. That I can, I can definitely do an approximate nearest neighbor search over a million vectors more quickly than an exact nearest neighbor search if I'm only having to search, in, let's say, you know, 4,000, 5,000 of them. But this gets into a concept that's really weird for database folks. And I can tell you the first time I saw this, it, it threw me for a loop. We, we, we introduced something called recall. And recall, you know, recall can mean different things, but in the machine learning context, it's returning, it's the percentage of your expected results. And you're like, wait, Jonathan, what do you mean, expected results? When I write a query like select star from table, you know, order by, you know, find me my 10 nearest neighbors, I expect to see my 10 nearest neighbors. But with approximate nearest neighbor search, we're only approximating it. 
So we might not actually be getting our 10 closest neighbors based upon the indexing method or the embedding model we're using or you know, some other factors that might be involved. So we have to measure what we expect. It's a very easy calculation. It's that, let's say I, you know, in a normal query, exact nearest neighbor search, I expect to see you know, these 10 vectors. But in my approximate nearest neighbor search, I only get eight out of the, these 10 vectors. My recall is 80%. And this is something that you do need to be mindful of when you're doing these vector searches, because while you're able to build an index of approximate nearest neighbors that is relatively quick, you might not necessarily get the results you expect, and then you have to tune the query. And typically, to increase recall, you're going to end up decreasing performance because you're going to have to search more vectors. So before we start diving in, into you know, what this all means for Postgres, there, is some, there are good, some good general questions to keep in mind when you're looking at vector storage. The first is, do you even need it? Does it fit into your workflow, or is it something that can work entirely in memory? And you know, ver, you know, it very well can be. You know, there's some great, there's some great uh, in-memory libraries out there that can do this work today. But you know, if you're dealing with, let's say, a million 1,500 dimensional vectors, you probably need to store them somewhere, you know, similar to some of the work you may have been doing with JSON back in the day. Because then you have to calculate how much data are you storing, and where does it make the most sense to store? If you're storing trillions of vectors, you know, unfortunately, Postgres might not be the best solution for that today. You know, may, maybe it will be in a year or two, but it's, you know, the, you know, understanding how much you need to store impacts what you ultimately do with it. And then there are these four properties that are always going to be at tension with each other when you finally commit to a vector storage system. It's going to be the storage itself, you know, how you're storing it, the underlying storage, how much performance that you want, because you might just, you know, and this is where cost comes in, you might need to pay more to get the performance you want, or you might have to, uh, you might have to sacrifice relevancy and use some, some more aggressive approximate nearest neighbor techniques to be able to get, you know, achieve the performance you're looking for. So those are all intention, and once you figure out what matters most to you, then you have to figure out what your trade-offs are. Is it going to be, you know, are you going to, you know, build in, in you know, what, what are going to be your index build parameters? You know, what exact query time are you looking for? And it'll make this can impact your schema design. But I think one of the reasons we're all here today is we, we want to understand you know, where Postgres fits in as a vector store. And you know, this keeps coming back. You know, I like to keep coming back to the fact that a vector is just a data type. It's a data type with well-defined properties. And interestingly, Postgres is very good at dealing with data types with well-defined properties. And again, alluding to back what Simon Riggs said in the keynote, Postgres is designed to be very extensible. And What's interesting is, you know, it, you know, beyond the fact that Postgres is very extensible, it's almost like Postgres has a type for that. It's actually had native vector support pretty much since the beginning. The array data type comes back from the early days of Postgres when I was at Berkeley as a more efficient way to, to store access control rules. And it supports a lot of the different kinds of aspects you need to be able to store vector data. But currently in Postgres, it, it lacks uh, some of the foundational elements to be able to build vector indexes on it, you know, namely the, the distance operations. And there's ways you can add to it, but uh, they're currently not there yet, at, le at least not in core Postgres. There's also the cube data type, which is kind of a misnomer, because the cube data type can store up to 100 dimensional, or it can index up to 100 dimensional vectors. Um, it, you know, it supports only, you know, only one kind of um, dimensional type float aid, which is a, a little bit large for what we're seeing in the machine learning models. But it's indexable. You can actually use the gist index to build uh, an exact nearest neighbor index. But given the size of the vectors we're seeing from the machine learning models, it doesn't exactly work for it. And this is where the power of extensions comes in, and an extension known as peachy vector. So quick show of hands, how many folks here are familiar with peachy vector? Cool. How many folks are running PG Vector? Cool. Definitely have questions for you later. So PG Vector started uh, in, uh, in 2021 uh, by a developer named Andrew Kane, who uh, uh, correctly anticipated that there was suddenly going to be a surge of vector data coming towards databases. And I'd say in the past year, there's definitely been an, an acceleration in development of it, particularly as the, we see this prevalence of machine learning systems. Um, it adds exactly what you think it does. It adds a vector data type. It adds a couple of indexing methods we're going to go into depth. And it supports all the different, it basically gives you a lot of choices in terms of how you query your vector data. Whether you want to do an exact nearest neighbor search where you need that recall of 
or an approximate nearest neighbor search because a recall of 90% is good enough for what you're looking for. One of the things I do want to dive into really quick is you know, a topic that's come up quite a bit, which is how does Peachy Vector perform overall? And first, vector, you know, performance of vector systems is, uh, is one of those things that's considered a hot topic. And it's important to understand the key, the key uh, axes to measure. That when you're looking at, for example, like if you're looking at a, a query performance benchmark, which this is, you need to be able to talk about performance and recall. Recall is actually embedded in this. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you don't see a benchmark showing performance and recall, or like what recall level you're measuring, or the data set you're using, or how big the vectors are, you, know, you do need to ask more questions about it. There are similar questions when you're dealing with index building, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So in this data set, uh, these were uh, 1536 dimensional vectors. And see, I committed a faux pas already on this slide. I didn't say how big the, the data set was. I believe this was a million or 10 million vectors, which I think is a million. Anyway, there's a big difference between the two. But what I did was I, I kept turning up a parameter that helps to increase the recall, which we'll see in a few slides with HNSW. And we can see that, you know, as, as expected, every time you try to increase your recall, you're going to take a hit on performance. You know, and it's good to grade, you know, in this case, it degraded you know, fairly linearly until you know, I really ratcheted it up. The other thing to note is that hardware selection matters. And it's important to understand what are the, what are the underlying hardware properties you have. In this case, I was testing a particular uh, CPU chip, um, the Graviton 2 versus the Graviton 3. And I saw a lot more performance of the Graviton 3, and particularly as I, you know, we really cranked up uh, the test and we're looking over a larger set of vectors. But the good news overall is that PG Vector does perform very well, but you do need to know how to use it. So we're going to talk about a few key concepts in PG Vector and then just explore the, diff the different ways of using it. And the first is knowing your distance. There's three indexable in, uh, distance operations supported in PG Vector. There's Euclidean distance, which is line of sight. So that's you know, me looking out uh, at you in, in the audience and vice versa. There's cosine distance, which is an angular distance. Um, so you know, it's a distance like this. And there's an inner product, which is sort of like the overlapping distance between the two vectors. I still don't have a good a visualization of it. What we're seeing a lot, particularly with the models generating 1,536 dimensional vectors, is that the cosine distance is giving the results with the highest recall. Now, the one thing with cosine distance, I don't have the formulas up here, but there's more operations in the cosine distance. That you know, If you look at what it is, there's going to be a division operation in it um, and a few more multiplication operations. And division is costly, particularly with these vectors, because if you're doing division over 1,500 dimensions and, say, a million times, that's a lot of division. You know, that's going to that's eat up CPU. But we can take one shortcut here. And the shortcut is in how we actually index a vector in PG vector, which is we normalize it. Now, again, this is where you know, we, we as database folks have a concept of normalization that's different than the math folks. So database folks, we think of normalization as reducing the amount of information that we are ultimately storing uh, you know, in our schema. So that way, we're removing duplicates. With vectors, normalization is saying the vector to have a magnitude of 1. And why that's important is that if we set the vector to have a magnitude of 1, we can take some shortcuts in some of our distance operations. So with the cosine distance, we're able to eliminate some of the division, which means that when we're actually doing those lookups and the index, they're going to be a lot faster because we're cutting out an operation. So what happens is PG vector is going to check if a vector is normalized before it inserts into the index. And if not, it normalizes it. And likewise, on the query, it's going to do that same exact check and then query against the normalized vectors. Now, this, again, this is very nice because it saves us some work in the long term. And it allows us just to really care more about how we're actually indexing things. So as I mentioned, PG Vector has two types of approximate nearest neighbor indexes available. There's IVF flat, which stands for uh, you know, inverted flat. Uh, I messed up all the Fs. It's, it's, it, it's inverted flat index. And HS, HNSW, which is hierarchical navigable small worlds. Both of them are great tongue twisters. I encourage you to practice saying them out loud at home. Now, each of these methods have Two you know, they're actually very different methods to achieve the same thing. IVF flat is a clustering algorithm. Basically, what happens is that, here, we could do IVF flat in this room. Let's say I want to find three centers. 
and cluster everyone in this room around these three centers. There's different ways of doing that. K-means is a, a very well-studied algorithm. It's actually, I believe it's NP-hard, so everything's approximate. But we go and we approximate the three centers in the room, and then we build groups around them. And as for an index, that's how you're clustered. What's nice about this is we're going to see is that it's actually a very fast indexing method. It's very fast to build it, but we might have to pay trade-offs when we're actually querying the index. Then there's HNSW, uh, which is, I'd say it's probably the most prevalent one today across all the different vector databases, and that's graph-based. And it works a little bit different in terms of the index building. What, what we're going to see is that we're going to build different layers in our index that go from you know, lightly coupled to you know, heavily coupled as we get denser. And the idea is that you're building neighborhoods around you. So, you know, you're saying like, hey, there's like a bunch of people around me that seem very similar. You know, I'm going to build links between them because more likely than not, these are the vectors that are most closely related to me. So that way, when I query, it's almost like I'm descending a tree in a way. I mean, replace tree with graph. A graph is a superset of a tree. And we're doing this like very efficient search where we don't have to see as, many, as, mu as much data within the graph but I'm able to find this neighborhood around me that should likely be vectors that are the most similar to me. So the nice thing about this is that there's not necessarily a correct answer in terms of which one of these you should choose. A lot of it is case dependent, and you might find with the data set you're using or the embedding model you're using or the foundational model you're using or the distance operator you're using, see what I'm getting at? There might be some experimenting you need to do, which again, is a little bit different you know, to us database folks because normally we're used to things being very exact. I build a B tree, it's very exact. I'm going to get back the answers, I think. So all of this does take some experimentation, but maybe some quick pointers on which ones you should choose. If you need exact nearest neighbor, you're not going to use any index. You're going to do that brute force search. You're going to look over all 1,500,000 dimensional uh, vectors, and that's that. you got to pay for the memory. you got to deal with it. If the index build time is most important to you, you're going to use IVF flat. Maybe you have, you know, maybe you're, you know, you know, bulk importing vectors all the time. You're building different, you know, different databases where you just need to be constantly building your indexes. IVF flat is, you know, is your choice there. It's way faster than HNSW for that. But if you're like me and you're an app developer at heart, uh, you want set and forget. So you're going to use something like HNSW because oftentimes the defaults just work. We're discovering HNSW in, for PG Vector is still relatively new, so we're discovering more and more about it. But it tends to be a little bit easier to use from the app developer standpoint. And really what I think most folks are concerned with is I want both like really fast queries, but I want really fast queries that have high recall. I'm going to use HNSW, in part because it's very easy to manage, but in part because we see like from its design, we're getting, we're getting, that, uh, we're getting those you know, very fast high recall queries. So this will get into uh, some of our best practices, because there's, the, you know, while a lot of our common Postgres best practices apply here, there are some other considerations, particularly because of the, uh, you know, approximate nearest neighbor uh, properties of, P, uh, of storing vector data, but also in terms of storage, because they're so long. So first, let's just dive into storage. And again, I feel like, you know, we could spend a lot of time on this. I might breeze through a little bit of this to make sure we have time for questions, but... The first thing is toast matters here. How many folks are familiar with toast? Cool. So I was blissfully ignorant of toast for most of my career when I was on the, uh, the app developer slash operational side of Postgres. And I became you know, much more familiar with toast. You know, I mean, I knew of it, but like, I didn't really care about it per se. And what's nice about toast is that it's actually designed for data like vector data, which is very large. So Postgres can only store eight kilobytes of data in a page. Clearly, we have data that can extend beyond a page, and the Toast system was set up to be able to handle that. What, another thing I learned you know, my, in my own personal vector journey was that, by default, Postgres will toast any data over two kilobytes. So you're actually toasting pretty frequently for these larger vectors. That as soon as you're over 5 to 10 dimensional uh, vectors, you're toasting them. So does this matter? And the answer is, like, yes, it will, in particular because of this slide. Postgres has different column types that actually are implicitly set. Like, you may never adjust this. Like, quick show of hands, how many of you have adjusted your column type before? Okay, so a handful, but not, you know, I didn't see everyone's hands go up, you know, to, as compared to some of the previous questions. And what's important to note is that currently, PG Vector 
by default uses the extended type, which means I'm going to toast and compress the vector. But you can say, wait a second, Jonathan, didn't you say you can't compress this data? That's correct. So actually, in an upcoming PG vector release, we're likely going to move it to external, which is basically store, you know, once the vector is toastable, store it out of line and don't do compression. But that plane is very interesting because depending if you're using extended and plane and the size of the vector, you might see very different results. So here's an example of, two, we're going to do a couple of exact nearest neighbor searches, so full table scans, where we're going to see how toast impacts the plan. So here's a 128-dimensional vector. Um, I believe there's 10 million of them. And you know, I, I was using a very, you know, I was using, I think, a 64-core machine. You know, I turned up you know, as many, uh, as many of, uh, parallel workers as I could. And for this data set, I got six parallel workers. Cool. I then tried this for 1,500-dimensional vectors. I didn't, you know, I didn't change anything, you know, 10 million of them. And I got four parallel workers planned. So six for 120-dimensional vectors, and then a vector that's more than 10 times bigger had four parallel workers. And that's the impact of toast. Because what's nice about toast is that your, you know, your table or your heap is going to look a lot smaller because you're not storing all that data in the heap. It's being stored in, in, you know, in your toast table. But Postgres is actually not used to the idea that some a part of your query in the hot path is actually in the toast section. Typically, you're using that for some kind of post filtering. So you need to be mindful of that. And if you want to be able to induce more parallel workers if you're doing these exact, neighbor, exact nearest neighbor scans, you actually might need to switch from using extended or external storage to plain storage. There's also this parameter I've learned, min parallel table scan size, that can help induce more parallel workers in a scan. So in this case, I believe I did keep, um, I did keep toast set to, or storage set to extended. And I set min parallel table scan size to one. And we got 11 workers for 1,500 dimensional vectors, which makes a lot more sense because it's a lot more data that we need to be able to pull out and compare. So again, you know, as an app developer, I started learning like, a lot of new things in terms of how to query the data. And these are things that you have to be mindful of when querying these vectors. Now, let's talk a little bit about the indexing methods. And we're going to start with HNSW. So HNSW, as I mentioned, it does give you the best performance recall ratio as compared to IVF flat, but that's because you're doing more work up front. You have to do the work in building the index. And there's two parameters that affect that. There's M. M is the number of bidirectional links that each vector within the index is keeping. So remember, we're building neighborhoods with HNSW. It's all the people that are around me. So when I build a link, I'm basically building a neighbor. The more links you have, the more likely you'll go create a neighborhood of vectors that you're most similar to. But the trade-off is, if you build more links, it's going to take more time, and there will be a graph for that. The other parameter that we have is something called EF construction, which in the HNSW paper, it's just called EF. This just distinguishes it for a PG vector. And EF construction keeps a list of all the vectors you've seen as you traverse the graph. The idea is that if you, if you have more vectors in that list, you're more likely to keep a set of vectors that are ultimately your, your nearest neighbors. So building an index is actually kind of cool. We're going to look, we're going to build an HNS, we're going to add a vector to an HNSW index real quick. So here's a bunch of vectors. Here's a, here's a query vector or a new vector to add to the index. So at the top level, so remember, it's very sparse. So we're not going to have many vectors there. We're going to find a vector that we're very similar to. We might end up building a link to it. It depends on uh, where you're at with your layering, but the idea is that you don't have that many vectors, so it's going to be a relatively quick search at the top layer. You then go down to the next layer, it's going to be a bit denser. You might, need to, you might build some more links between vectors, depending on what you're doing, until you get to the bottom layer, where you're going to maximize how many links that you build. That's going to be your densest layer. We're going to see how that pays off when we query it, which is actually the next slide. But the idea is that as you go from uh, less dense to more dense, one, it's going to help speed up the searches, but two, you're going to be placed into a neighborhood that should be most similar to what kind of vector you are. So when we query, if we, you know, in order to be able to balance recall, um, we have EF search, which is similar to EF construction. It's keeping a list of vectors that I'm most similar to. And the larger the size of the list, the more likely you're going to have higher recall for those results. You, the one catch for us database folks is that EF search must be greater than or equal to limit. If your EF search is lower than your limit, you're not going to get all the results that you can possibly see. So that's a little quirk to keep in mind. I forget if PG Vector throws an error for that. It, it might. 
So querying is very easy. And what's cool about querying is that it's kind of like querying a B tree, that as you, as you move through the graph, you, uh, you, know, you keep finding the vectors you're most similar to. And you know, it's, it's almost logarithmic. Like you're going down, and you're going to be in the neighborhood that you expect to be in, and you're done. So best practices, the defaults tend to work, but you might need to play around with uh, how you build it out based upon your data set, your embedding model, et cetera. But one quirk, at least currently with PG Vector, is that to build the index, you need to, be, you need to use concurrent writes right now in order to get performance. So concurrent write is basically using multiple, multiple connections to you know, insert or copy the vectors. The new version of PG Vector will allow for uh, parallel builds, the new unreleased version, I should say. And it does have a huge impact. So again, I was using a very big machine. I had 64 cores available. And as I increased the amount of concurrency to it, so the number of concurrent insert statements in this case, we can see like it shaves off, like there's, an, there's a quadratic shave off in uh, insertion time to the point where it goes from taking an hour to insert this data set to taking a minute. So that's important too. The other tuning parameters are EF construction and M. And the general guidance right now is tune EF construction first. So EF construction remembers the list of vectors you take going through the graph. Um, right now, the default for PG vector is 64. And we can see as we push up, uh, we you know, go to 128, 256, we do, we're able to bump up recall. But it does have an impact on build time. You know, it's not, it sort of like linearly grows as, as we increase it. And we do get better recall. Eventually, you get diminishing returns. So then you stop turning it up because you're just wasting, you're wasting compute. M has a greater impact. Um, so M, this, is a, this was the GIST 960 data set, which is actually, for whatever reason, it's just such a toxic data set for people with approximate nearest neighbor algorithms. Like, I'm not sure why. I think it has to do with like, image data, but it's just very hard to like, get a good result on that data set. But if you crank up M, actually, you can see going from M of 16 to M of 48, we went from about uh, 0.5 recall, and, uh, you know, a low EF search query to 0.8 recall and beyond. But look at that build time. Like, that's toxic. Like, it took way longer to get there. So again, if you have a need to get you know, very precise query or very, you know, very high recall queries, but with a low EF search value, M can help you get that by cranking it up, but you are going to pay in the index build time. So I'm going to skip ahead because there's some cool stuff. Um, well, just maybe I'll summarize this real quick. For HNSW, remember, your, how you build your index is going to impact ultimately your query performance and your recall. So I do want to get through IVF flat real quick. Um, IVF flat does take a little bit more work to tune. Uh, you basically are defining things into lists or buckets or centers. Pick your terminology. And you set that up front. And one of the big differences between IVF flat and HNSW is HNSW, you can start from an empty table and build the index. In fact, that's probably the best way to do it right now. With IVF flat, your table must be populated when you build the index. And effectively, it's just a clustering algorithm. That if I say I want three lists, then we find three centers, and we cluster all the vectors around those centers. And then when we query, we choose how many centers we want to visit. And that's, the, that's that IVF flat probes parameter. And the key thing with this is that the more probes you add, the, the better the results you're likely going to see. Now, in an ideal world, you only want to visit one list because then you're, you know, you're minimizing your query time. But you know, as you can see in this example, if I set my probes to two, I'm going to get a vector that's closer to me. And again, this might be a practicality versus a reality situation, that your data set might work perfectly well with IVF flat, you can keep your number of, you know, you find the right number of lists, you keep your probes low, and you're getting very fast queries. IVF flat can actually outperform HNSW in that regard based upon the size of your overall lists. But again, it all depends. And that's kind of the scary thing to us database folks is that it's not an exact science. Like, it's going to take, well, it's a science, but it's a science where you have to experiment to figure out what makes the most sense for you. Um, so the other thing with IVF flat is that it is sensitive to memory. You might need to tune memory parameters uh, beyond what you're normally used to, in particular working memory. And this is why HNSW tends to be a little bit easier to use because there's less work you have to do. Now, one key thing with IVF flat, particularly with, since PG Vector 05, is that it does support parallel builds. And you do want to take advantage of that. Because the biggest bottleneck prior when building the index was that when you were doing the list assignment, Behind the scenes, PG Vector was doing a sequential scan over your table. So 
if you have 10 million records on the table, you're basically going through all 10 million one by one by one by one. Could take a little bit of time. But in the newer version of PG Vector, it supports a parallel scan, which is a lot faster because instead of doing you know, 10 million records one by one by one by one, you can have multiple uh, workers doing it. Um, in some of, some of the testing actually I did, uh, I saw an improvement up to 4x. I had one data set, I think it was like 100 million, 768 dimensional vectors, and the build time went, I'm gonna hand wave it, from like 24 hours to six hours. And this, in this set, which is much smaller, was about a 2x speed up, but certainly impactful. Now, the big thing emerging in vector queries is something called filtering, which to us, uh, Postgres folks, we know as a where clause. And you know, this is, you know, this is you know, typically something that's very uh, popular when you write any SQL query, is that I want to break down my data further to get the exact result set that I want. But this gets weird with vector data. That's kind of the theme today, right? Like with vectors, it just gets weird for some reason. What happens when I'm using one of these approximate nearest neighbor indexes and I have a where clause, the first thing is if I don't do anything else, Postgres might just choose not to use the index at all. It might say like, hey, it's faster for me to do a sequential scan. And in most cases, like that might be, but if I have, let's say I'm down to like 40,000, uh, 1,500 dimensional vectors after I do a where clause, that's work. Like you, you want to rather do the approximate nearest neighbor search then. What then might also happen is Postgres might choose to use the index, but you don't get enough results back that because you're doing the vector search first, you might not have the appropriate scalar properties or the, the, the values that you want in the where clause in the set that gets reduced down, and suddenly you have too few results. So we need to have a balance between this, and the first thing you need to ask is, for, do I even need an approximate nearest neighbor index for a filter? And again, it depends, because how you're actually breaking down the data might actually reduce the set to something small enough where it'd be just faster to say, use a B tree, get a smaller subset of information, and do the exact nearest neighbor search on that. So that's the first thing to you know, evaluate in terms of the data, but if you do need a filter ultimately, because you're still in like this you know, 10,000, 20,000 vector camp after you filter it down, there's some things you can do today and one thing coming tomorrow. The first thing is you can build a partial index, another wonderful Postgres feature where you can build an index on a filter over a subset of the data. Um, popular technique already being used in production to great success by some uh, PG Vector users I've talked to. The next thing you can do is you can partition your data, which is kind of similar. You know, partition is going to break your data down into a smaller subset, and then you can build your approximate nearest neighbor index on that. So these are imperfect because it does take some additional work, you know, particularly I'd say from an application developer standpoint, but it does help break down, you know, if you have like a lot of vectors, like this is probably a technique you want to use anyway to be able to reduce the, the general data set size. There's also some, uh, this is just like a little, th this came up in the PG Vector GitHub repo, so I thought it was worth sharing, where I want to filter, the, the question was, I want to filter on a vector within my data set but I want to exclude it from the overall data set. So kind of seeing like where does my vector fit in to like everything else around me. Um, this actually does use the index. It's kind of like a, in this case it was two vectors. Um, so you can do queries like this, but again, this is where from an app developer perspective, it's like, oh, I have to like really dive deep into SQL to write a you know, kind of a contrived query, but you can do it, but we need to find a way to make it easier. So this is where we're going to look ahead a little bit in terms of what's on the roadmap. Um, the first thing, uh, which I discovered, I think, when I was giving one version of this talk, was that parallel builds for HNSW were committed, targeted for the next version of PG Vector. And what's nice about that is, excuse me, <coughs> is that you can now basically start with a full table and build an HNSW index on it. But there's going to be some trade-offs in terms of how much memory you have available in the system. And I'm hoping the next time I give this talk, I'll be able to compare, like, when do you use a parallel HNSW build versus when you use the concurrent insert or copy strategy. Now, this filtering problem is becoming, I think, it's been becoming quite big. And there's actually a method for it. Uh, there's a paper published earlier this year called HQANN, which describes a methodology where you're effectively keeping your filter values within your HNSW index and using that to traverse the HNSW index alongside those filtered values. That's another way of saying pre-filtering, or it's kind of like going through a multi-column index, but you know, with a you know with a vector and doing the you know the the similarity search between that. 
So you can actually test that out today. Um, I was actually talking to a PG vector user who had a big need for this problem. I believe it's like they had a 100 million vector data set, but they really need to filter on it. They've been testing it out. They're seeing both great performance and recall results with it. But you know, please, you know, please test it out. You know, one thing the PG Vector project is really big on is giving feedback before committing things in order to try to keep things as stable as possible in the repo. Um, more data types per dimension, which is one way to be able to shrink the overall size of the vectors being stored. But remember, every time you shrink a vector down, like if you go from a float four to a flow two, you are going to lose some information that might make it more difficult to distinguish the vectors, particularly if you have a lot of them and if they're very high dimensional. But if, you're, if your machine learning model is outputting you know, flow two or u and eight vectors, well, cool, this is going to help uh, save you a lot of space. So one of the techniques for compression is called quantization. Um, there's been two techniques proposed for PG vector, product quantization, scalar quantization. They're both, uh, they're both used in other different systems. A scalar quantization is effectively going from like a, a float four to a u and eight, so like going from a four byte value to a one byte value. So you lose some information, but not as much. Pro quantization is going from say like a 120 dimensional vector to an eight dimensional vector and using you know, some kind of, uh, there's like the, uh, a clustering uh, method involved to try not to lose too much information. So definitely reduces the size of your overall vectors, which is generally good for querying it, but it impacts recall. And finally, parallel query which uh, I would say actually HNSW has temporarily mooted the need for parallel query because it is relatively efficient. But as we get larger and larger HNSW indexes, I think that will grow. There's definitely use cases for parallel query for IVF flat. So in conclusion, to bring it back around, you know, we spend a lot of time up front talking about why are vectors a big deal these days. You know, they're a big deal for the app developer, similar to the way JSON was you know, 15 years ago. I mean, JSON's still a big deal today. But much like JSON, it's just a data type. And what post, there's, there's some things Postgres is really good at. Like one, it's really good at storing structured data. Um, it's very good at uh, being extended to be able to support all, all the different methods around storing structured data. And it's also really good at being a database. Like Postgres does a lot of things for you that you don't need to worry about. Um, and I think you know, that's really, that really that's a lot of the magic here. You will have a design decision between uh, query performance and recall uh, as you're building uh, stuff with vector data, as well as when you want to invest your resources. And last but not least, this is rapidly evolving. So make sure, as much as you're planning for today and what you're building, also plan for tomorrow. And you know, I, I was an early adopter of the Postgres JSON functionality, which frankly was limited at the time, but worked for my use case. And as Postgres added more features, I was able to easily adopt those into my app. So I believe we are at time. Thank you so much. Um, and I, do we have time for questions? We have time, we have time for a couple of questions. Thank you.